Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Census 2020, We All Count. Um, for those of you who are new to the Silicon Valley Council of Nonprofits, my name is Jennifer Tarai. I am the Director of Learning and Member Engagement for SBCN. SBCN is a member organization for nonprofits in our area. We provide support for nonprofits in the form of policy development, advocacy, we provide learning opportunities for nonprofit staff at all levels, and we um, often provide other types of support, you know, depending on what your organization needs. Um, we are working with United Way Bay Area to present this workshop um, in an effort to really ensure that we get a complete count in Santa Clara County for the U.S. Census. And the reason why we want to make sure we do that is because we understand how important it is for um, our community to be counted and to be able to access the funds that are associated with the census. And so today's workshop is really going to help people who work with um, families and those hard to count communities so that you can have some specific tools and um, language that you can engage staff and families with um, so that people can really understand the importance of the census and be encouraged to help us get a complete count. And before I introduce our speaker, Amina, um, I want to go through a few logistics. Um, we are going to be using, well, we, if we have more, uh, more of a crowd, we will be using the breakout rooms. Um, we are recording this session. Um, and please feel free to type your questions in the chat box at any time. I want to tell you about a few of the things that are coming up for SVCN as well. Um, on July 21st, we're going to have session four of our Road to Reopening series. Um, and if you haven't heard of that, it's in, co in collaboration with CADRE, which is our um, coordinating agencies um, responding to disaster. Um, and this series is really intended to support nonprofits as you're ready to reopen your doors. So session four on the 21st is going to be about sharing space, um, you know, figuring out other ways to save money during uh, this time. We also encourage you to go to SVCN's website and check out our, um, our solidarity statement. Um, we are planning to put out a resource page, resource hub, um, in conjunction with Thrive Alliance for Nonprofits and the Center of Excellence for Nonprofits. And we really need our community's feedback to know what are the resources that you want, what are the tools that you want, um, you know, what kind of support do you want and need for your organization to be able to move your race equity work forward. So please check out our website, send me an email and let me know what it is that you want um, so that we can help you do your work. Also, very big event coming up for us, um, the Funding Your Impact Summit. And if you have not heard of this event, uh, it was formerly an in-person event and this year we are taking it virtual just as many others are, um, but this one is this series is going to be focused on fundraising and development so that we can help your nonprofits become stronger and more financially sound. So check out the website again, um, sbcn.org, so that you can see what we did last year, um, get all these dates on your calendar, and we are still looking for speakers. So if you know any amazing fundraising and development professionals who you think can offer something to the nonprofit community, please send them to this website and have them fill out our call for speakers. Lastly, if you are not yet a member of SVCN, we welcome you <laughs> and we encourage you to check out um, our membership page also at svcn.org. Um, membership really includes all of those things that I mentioned at the top of the program. We want to support our nonprofits in any way we can. And another added benefit is to be able to access events that are member exclusive and also get discounts for our ticketed events. Um, so check out our membership page if you haven't joined us yet. And we have a new option for those of you who are not um, with a nonprofit org. So maybe you're a consultant, maybe you are um, with a foundation or you're with a corporation, you can become an ally member. So again, svcn.org, become a member today if you aren't yet. And thank you to all of you who are currently members and who have renewed your membership for this year. So on that note, <laughs> I want to introduce Amina. She is with the United Way Bay Area and I like to think of her as a census guru. Um, she <laughs> has worked very hard to make sure that our workshops are really accommodating, um, tailored to the communities that we serve. And so 
I just want to express my appreciation for Amina and for all the work that you put into this. And I will say no more and let you take it away. Okay, thanks, Jen. So as Jen said, I'm Amina, Amina Lukman, and I'm the program manager at United Way Bay Area. Um, before I get into the presentation, just want to let you all know, in case you haven't heard, United Way Bay Area is a poverty fighting organization in the Bay Area that is also the administrative community-based organization for the San Francisco Bay Area um, for census outreach. So that basically means that we're a funder for um, great um, community-based organizations like SBCN and about 90 other community-based organizations in the seven counties that make up um, the Bay Area, according to the census. Um, and we're also um, a regional coordinator. So we're working with the county census teams and other funders to make sure that, you know, our region gets a complete count and that we're all, you know, coordinating and working together to do that work. And we're also a technical assistance provider. So we have, in addition to giving training, we have a resource folder that I'll link you all to um, at the end of the presentation, um, providing the infrastructure for things like phone banking, text message outreach, um, and a number of different things, virtual questionnaire, questionnaire assistance, um, to name a few. Um, so yeah, without further ado, I'm just going to get started. Um, feel free, just because especially this is a more, you know, intimate conversation to, you know, stop me whenever you have a question. I'll try to be conscious about stopping myself in different sections to see if there are any questions. Um, but yeah, I'm going to start with Census 101. I'm sure we've kind of heard this all before, um, so I'll go through it pretty quickly. That's the five W's and H of Census. Um, I tailored this presentation to focus more on the importance of counting all kids in the census. Um, as I'll talk about a little bit later, children tend to be very undercounted in the census, um, and it's really important for their future, for our community's future, that they are counted. We'll do a little bit of a census quiz. Um, hopefully it'll be fun just to kind of test our knowledge and answer any questions that may come up from that. And then just kind of based on how you all are feeling, we'll either do breakout rooms to kind of practice having these conversations about the census with community members, or just kind of go over a sample script and answer any questions that you all may have. All right, so to kind of start with the 101, what is the census? It's a government survey that asks basic questions like the age, name, race, and ethnicity of each person living in your household or your address. It's constitutionally mandated survey required by law of all people living in the United States. Um, unlike voting or some another kind of civic engagement, it is just for anyone that's living here in the United States. So it does not ask about your immigration or citizen status. You are not excluded from the census because of that or because you're formerly incarcerated or anything like that. If you live here, um, you should be counted on the census. And I'll talk a little bit why it's so important in the next slide. Um, but something that I kind of like to remind people is it's super simple, nine questions, very basic questions, takes no longer than 10 minutes. In fact, it takes most people like three to five minutes and it has an impact for 10 years. Um, so as I'll keep saying, this is a once in a decade opportunity, only happens every 10 years. And if you're missed on the census, you don't have the opportunity to make sure your community gets the resources that come with an accurate census count until um, 10 years later. So if you don't get counted on the 2020 census, you don't have an opportunity to do that until 2030. Um, so why do we get counted? Those, your census responses, your, those nine answers to the um, questions on the census questionnaire are combined into exit statistics about the population, about your city, about your state, and about the nation that are used to make super important policy and budget decisions. Um, so it's basically the snapshot that people in power use to decide where resources actually, in fact, where $1.5 trillion of resources, federal funding, goes each year um, for things like building better roads and schools. Um, you know, something we talk about in the Bay Area is like the census count could determine how many three-door fart trains we get on our commute because they know that this area has this many people and there might be more traffic or how many bus stops are in your community. By getting an accurate census count, they know that a certain number of people are in this community and it shouldn't, they shouldn't have to, you know, walk 20 minutes or drive 20 minutes to get to the nearest bus stop. Um, it's 
um, deciding how many schools are built in the community and how much funding goes to those, those schools or free or reduced lunches um, and things that help young people thrive. Um, it's used to create jobs where businesses are going to go um, and fund a number of community programs that I'll get a little bit into in the next couple of slides that are for everyone that we all use um, and that really make our communities accessible and make our communities stronger. Um, it's also used to improve housing, especially affordable housing. Um, it's truly, when you think about the census, it's, it's wild how many things are, um, you know, determined by the census count. So how many programs um, their funding is either determined wholly or in part by the census count. And each person not counted could result in a loss of $1,000 a year in CUNY funding for all these programs for the next 10 years. Like I said, once in a decade opportunity, if you're not counting the census, your community, you as a person are missing out on funding, $10,000 of funding until 2030. Um, so who counts in the census? The easy answer is everyone. Like I said, babies, young children, seniors, immigrants, formerly incarcerated individuals, um, people that are experiencing homelessness, everyone that lives, that is living in the United States should be counted on the census. Um, how do most people get counted? So you can respond to the census online at my2020census.gov, by phone. This is the um, phone number for the English line. However, you can respond to the census in 12 languages or by mail. So when do we get counted? Um, census day was officially April 1st, which is kind of just the date that is used to make sure that the data is kind of clean and as the day that people should look to. Um, but you can respond online, by mail, or by phone until October 31st. So basically the census was extended and will end on October 31st. However, we're trying to uh, encourage community members to get counted today um, and before July 31st. Because come August, come mid-August, you will have census takers who are members of the community that have been hired by the census um, to support a complete count. Census takers will be um, knocking on doors of households that have not responded by mid-August. Um, so we're really encouraging people to respond online by phone or by mail before July 31st, because that way they're responding on their own time and they, won't, they know not to expect that door knock. I know a lot of people with COVID-19 or just in general don't really want people coming um, to their homes, coming and knocking on the door. Um, so that's the easiest way to ensure that no one's going to come knocking on your door. Um, if they do, they are people of our community. They will have masks, they will have PPE, and it will be safe, but it's just the easiest thing to respond right now and before the end of July online by phone or by mail. Amina, so I have a question. Yes. Oh, never mind. You are going to answer my question. Go ahead. <laughs> Are you sure? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Feel free to ask it if I don't. Um, so where do we get counted? The kind of rule of thumb is where you live and sleep most of the time. Um, and if that seems like that's hard to answer or confusing, then where you are living and sleep on April 1st. That's why I was kind of talking about census day as a marker. For most folks, where you live and sleep most of the time is where you were April 1st. And so where you live and sleep most of the time. Um, but for people like college students, for example, who given the COVID-19 pandemic may have moved out of their dorms, relocated and are living with family right now, they should be counted where they were living and sleeping most of the year um, and where they were April 1st, which is either off campus, um, in their college dorm, um, something like that. Um, and then I'll just kind of breeze through these next bullet points, but these there are basically um, different Census Bureau operations to count people that are experiencing homelessness. So people that are experiencing homelessness will be counted at service locations, such as shelters and soup kitchens, or outdoors between September 22nd and the 24th. Um, people living in what the Census Bureau is calling transitory locations, such as RV parks or motels or campgrounds, will be counted where they sleep in September. And people living in group quarters, such as college um, on-campus housing, nursing home, and correctional facilities will be counted at those locations um, between April and September. So that's been an ongoing operation. And that's all done by the Census Bureau. 
But for a lot of us, we want to be counted on our own, online, by phone or by mail, where we live and sleep most of the time. Um, so as many of us may have seen, the Census Bureau has been sending kind of reminder postcards and mailers to invite people to respond to the census kind of every other week, um, starting in March. Um, and your address or your household has a unique ID code uh, that's included on that mailer. And so the ideal would be to use that ID code to respond online over the phone or by mail. Um, however, it's not required. So you might be talking to folks who are willing to get counted, but they don't remember getting a census mailing. They think they might have thrown it in, out in the recycling or something like that. They can still respond online or by phone without that census ID. Um, however, it's helpful to have it if they do. Did that answer your question? Are there any questions here? You definitely answered my question. Thank you. Okay, good. Um, and so that's a lot, but kind of the five things that we, we can distill um, everything that I said into these five things to share about the census. So you can answer online by phone or by mail. Again, encouraging people to respond before the end of July. Um, that the census is safe. Individual census responses are confidential and protected by law. So census takers, people that work with the Census Bureau are sworn to protect your, um, they swear in for life to protect your data. Um, and it's protected by extremely strong confidentiality laws. Um, and like I was saying earlier, your census response, one, are very basic questions like your name, your age, your race and ethnicity. Um, and even then they're combined into aggregate statistics, right? So when, these, when this data is used to make the policy decisions, they're not able to say, okay, Amina identifies as um, black African-American and lives at this address. It's just saying that, for example, I live in Oakland. There are this many people in Oakland. This percentage of this many people are children and thus will inform how much funding is put into things like Head Start, how much funding is put into um, free and reduced um, breakfast and lunches at schools. Um, so it's really, it's, it's safe and combined to anonymous statistics and super important, like I said, in determining federal funding and political representation for the next 10 years. Um, something that I forgot to mention is that census data is also used to determine how many seats you get in the House of Representatives. Um, again, the census does not ask about your citizenship or immigration status and that everyone counts. You should count all people living at your address, even if they're not related to you and especially including young children and babies. Um, so sometimes there's confusion about, you know, if you're sharing um, a space, a household with someone that's not related to you, whether it's a roommate that you might not like, or you have a family that's living in um, a backyard unit that you all same, share the same address, um, you should all be counted in the same census form. Um, before I go into this, I want to stop to see if there are any questions about what I covered so far. I don't have any questions, thank you. Okay, great. And also feel free, I'll try to monitor the chat as well. So if you don't wanna say it on a um, microphone, you feel free to type it into the chat. I'll try to answer questions there. Um, so like I said before, I kinda wanna focus a little bit on the cost of undercounting um, children and the importance of counting them in the census. Um, so in the last census in 2010, 1 million children were undercounted. Um, in fact, children are the most undercounted age group in the 2010 census. And our state of California had the highest undercount rate for young children in the nation. Um, some reasons that children tend to be undercounted is, you know, maybe even a lack of awareness about if children should be counted. Um, so thinking this is kind of an official survey, um, children can't vote, things like that. They're, they're, it's a baby, should I count them on my census? Um, so you have examples of people that filled out a census for their household, included the adults, maybe included the preteen, but didn't include the baby. Um, and as we've kind of talked about, that really has an effect on, you know, things that could um, benefit their, their childhood, and they won't be able to kind of reverse that um, for 10 years, and which is the majority of their childhood. Um, another reason is um, there are a number of what is considered hard to count groups um, in the census. Um, so people that are hard to count in the census, 
Um, some hard to count groups are low income families, renters, immigrants and refugees, um, people of color tend to be undercounted in the census, um, people that have, you know, low English proficiency or um, uh, are monolingual. And so you have children that are living in households, they're living, they're part of those um, undercounted or hard to count groups that makes them hard to count or miss in the census. Um, you also have children that live in what um, the census calls kind of like complex households. So maybe blended families, um, maybe foster children, um, maybe have children that are living with a relative um, or living with a friend, um, or maybe a child that is, um, that um, have parents that are separated and they live at one home for part of the time, another home for another half. So these are all kind of factors that contribute to children being undercounted in the census. Um, and like I was saying before, each child, each person not counted can result in a loss of $1,000 a year in community funding for the next 10 years. Um, and this is especially um, hard for children because it's affecting federal programs like Head Start and WIC and special education, Medicaid, NAP, CalFresh, um, children's health insurance program and housing assistance and so much more. So a lot of programs that are meant to kind of um, improve accessibility, um, whether that's accessibility, making healthcare more accessible, making education, good education more accessible, um, nutrition um, assistance programs or housing, insurance, all these things um, could be impacted from an undercount. It also affects, like I said, policy decisions. So things like should a new library be built in this community? Should a new school or hospital be built in this community? Should Head Start for pre-K be expanded? Um, so it's, it's really, I think sometimes we talk about the census, it's really easy to kind of distance ourselves from it and kind of think that it's, you know, some government thing that has to do with like a population count, how does this relate to my life? But really the census relates to everything, everything, all the services we use, just kind of what our communities look like, funding, representation, it really impacts everything in our life. Um, I really like this quote because it kind of speaks to that. Um, and I'll just read it. So this is from Count All Kids, which is an initiative to make sure that all children are counted in the census. Um, it's from their toolkit. And the quote reads, the consequences of an undercount are serious. The census data is used to allocate one and a half trillion dollars every year by formula. Put in human terms, lost dollars mean overcrowded classrooms, underfunded services, hungrier children, inadequate health care. Big problems for our communities and particularly for our poor and near poor children. Our kids lose when vital community resources dwindle. These resources are critical to the success of all children. Counting children helps them thrive. If we get it wrong in 2020, today's preschoolers will lose needed resources for a decade, the majority of their childhood. Um, yeah, so I like that quote because I think it really brings it into kind of like everyday terms of seeing how the census um, affects our lives um, and what not responding to nine questions that take about, you know, three to five minutes can really, um, the impact that it can have for the next 10 years. So I think next will be the quiz. So I just want to stop again to see if there are any questions before we get into the quiz. If not, let me also put the directions in the chat. So if you haven't used Kahoot before, it's kind of a fun online game show type thing. Um, so I'm gonna go to the Kahoot website to show the game show, but basically on your phone, if you can, you'll just wanna type kahoot.it into the address bar. Um, you can also play on your computer, but it would be better on your phone so that you can see Oh, whoops. So that you can see um, the screen. So I'm going to start this. Can everyone see? This screen. Yes. Okay, great. So just follow these directions. And I'll wait for your nickname to pop up and then we can start playing. Okay, great. Jen, are you gonna play? 
I am. I am logging in. <laughs> All right, let's start. So the first one will be a test question just to kind of get us situated. Okay, so test question, what's Amina's favorite color? Oh my goodness. <laughs> Know. And it's kind of confusing because I didn't really match up the colors. Yes, purple is my favorite color. Yay! <laughs> All right, next question. All right, Jen is in the lead. Finish your food, girl. The census questionnaire does not include a citizenship question, true or false. Nice, true, yes. So the census questionnaire does not include a citizenship question. It's very important that our communities know that. Um, there's a lot of, you know, because there was talk about a citizenship question and that was, um, you know, defeated by a lot of our community members and groups um, that made sure that that was not included on the census, but still just having talk about it um, has made a lot of people kind of wary of the census and not willing to participate. So it's really important that we let folks know that the census questionnaire does not have a citizenship question. And I just I say that. that, fun fact, um, the ACLU team that fought the citizenship question, um, the director of voter rights who was on that team was actually one of, he was our keynote speaker for um, Super cool. Activate your impact summit, which will be awesome. available for viewing on YouTube very soon. Okay, great. I'll look out for that. <laughs> All right, next question. How can you respond to the 2020 census? Online, over the phone, by mail, or all of the above? Two answers, one more. All of the above, good. So you can respond to the census online, over the phone, by mail, or all of the above. Sorry, <laughs> you can respond to the census online, over the phone, um, or by mail. <laughs> See, Elliot knew, I think it was just a slip of the finger. I know you guys are census experts. Oh, it says Jen is on fire, okay. I'm trying not to be um, unfair advantage over here. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think Sean Elliott are gonna, gonna beat you at something. The census questionnaire will ask for your driver's license number, your name, your social security number, your immigration status. Nice. So the census questionnaire will ask for a number of things, your name, your age, um, your race and ethnicity, but they will never ask you for your social security number, any bank account information, your citizenship or immigration status, your driver's license. They won't ask about your income either. Um, very basic questions, so good job with you. I'm trying to let Shar catch up. <laughs> the census happens once every blank year. Five, 10, three, seven. Nice. The census is, I keep saying, once in a decade opportunity happens once every 10 years. I'm not a huge fan of the music they have in the background, so I don't know how to change it. All right. I think there'll be one question that's gonna stump Jen, we'll see. Halfway through, which program's funding is impacted by census data? Section 8 Housing Assistance Payments Program, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, also known as SNAP, Medicaid, Medi-Cal, all of the above. Nice, good. I didn't even, I, I realized that in the presentation, I didn't really speak to the specific programs, but like I said, um, housing programs, nutritional assistance program, healthcare, education. Um, so these are all programs that are impacted by census data and use census data to determine um, how much funding is distributed to these programs in the nation and in your community. All right. The 2020 census asks you about your immigration or citizenship status, true or false. We can't get this wrong, right? Right, false. <laughs> really driving that home. <laughs> Had two questions about it. 
Okay. Census data is used to determine how blank amount of money is distributed in the U.S. every year. A thousand, a hundred thousand, one point five trillion, or ten million. Okay, I might be stumped this time because I cannot remember. Nice. So <laughs> one point it's used to determine how one point five trillion dollars is distributed in the U.S. every year um, for some of the programs that I already talked about and a number of other programs um, that are for similar things, community funding, um, making healthcare, education. Um, food and all these things more accessible. Um, so by, you know, showing when your community shows up to the census, you are kind of making sure that your community is accounted for for that funding. Oh, there she goes. <laughs> the tables have turned. Okay. <laughs> Which community is considered hard to count on the census? There are a number of communities. There are only, there are only a few. Um, young children and babies, immigrants and refugees, renters, all of the above. Nice. So all of the above. Um, what are some other communities that are considered hard to count on the census besides the ones that are listed here? Seniors. Mm -hmm. Seniors. Unhoused. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. People that are unhoused, people are experiencing homelessness. People of color. Yep, people of color. Great. All right. I think we have two more questions left. Yes. Communities could lose X amount of dollars for every person not counted in the 2020 census. $200, $10,000, $500. Yep. <laughs> Good job. $1,000 for every person not counted in the 2020 census. This is kind of the specific we go, we tend to use, but it's also um, could be the more conservative statistics, so it could be more. All I right. thought the slide said a thousand per person. <laughs> hmm? I thought the slide said a thousand per person. It is. What did it say? Ten thousand. Ten thousand. Oh, this was my trick question. <laughs> I should have said it before. This was kind of my trick question because it's a thousand per year. But I think the way that I framed it was how many could you miss? Uh, how did I frame the question? Did you miss out um, on the census? So since the census is every 10 years, it's kind of a little math problem. So 1,000 oh. times 10, 10,000. Oh, okay. But, but I forgot so the technically, question. Yeah, I think it's a little, it's, it requires a little bit more attention. But yes. So so technically, we all got it right then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let me see. The last one. Oh, no. When will census takers begin doing in-person interviews or door knocking? Mid-August, October 31st, September. Yes, so mid-August. So that's why we're encouraging folks to self-respond to the census on their own, online, by phone, or by mail before July 31st, um, because census takers will begin um, visiting households, knocking on doors of households that haven't responded um, in mid-August. So if you get your response in now, you won't get a door knock. And then October 31st is the last day that anyone has the opportunity to respond to the census. All right, last question. The census questionnaire will be available in blank number of languages. 2, 1, 12, 59. Nice. So the census questionnaire will be available in 12 languages. Um, the kind of the details of that is it's available in 12 languages online and over the phone. Um, the paper questionnaire is only available in English and Spanish. However, there are um, a number of resources put out by the Census Bureau and a number of um, community partners that basically translate or like walk you through how to respond online, kind of a step-by-step -step walkthrough, 59 different languages. Um, they have these kind of language guides that show you, um, give you like step-by-step -step instructions and in how to respond um, to the paper questionnaire and that's in 59 different languages. So language access is a big thing. So even though the official kind of site or response phone lines are only available in 12 languages, there are a number of resources um, in other languages to help folks um, navigate that process. 
All right. Good job, Shar. Oh, there I am, third place. <laughs> <laughs> We're all winners here. We're all winners here. So great job. Yay. Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> So this, I unfortunately don't have anything to give right now, but you get, you know, props, <laughs> you get the bragging right. Uh, cool. So I'm going to close this down and just see if there are any questions, um, either based on something I've covered from the previous slides or just from that um, census quiz. I'm trying to remember how I worded the, the question that there's a little bit of debate about, but basically it is, um, if you don't respond to the census, um, you can move. Um, you can lose a thousand dollars a year, um, but since the census only happens every ten years, you're basically missing out on um, ten thousand dollars in community funding. I don't know if there are any other questions that came up from the census quiz. Nope. I think we've got some experts on the line now. Yeah, it looks like it. <laughs> Uh, I see there's one thing in the chat. Okay, well, great, good job. See, Jen has been into a number of these trainings, but we had we had Elliot and Shar in the front. So, <laughs> congrats to you both. Um, I, all right, I'm tired, so <laughs> that's my excuse. <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> um, so just kind of you know, COVID nineteen has caused a lot of us to um, kind of adjust in many ways, um, and Sensitive outreach is no different. Um, so during shelter in place, we've kind of um, pivoted and amplified other um, things that people are already doing and pivoted towards um, phone banking and check-in calls. So these are also some things that can be incorporated. So um, phone banking is a really uh, effective strategy, phone banking or check-in calls to um, outreach, to do outreach about the census. So, Something that we are doing with a number of community partners is phone banking by geography using an app called PDI. Um, and we have, you know, some organizations that have phone bankers making hundred, more than a hundred calls a day, hundreds of calls a day, um, and getting folks to respond to the census, answering any questions they may have. Um, but a number of people are doing kind of check or incorporating census outreach into check-in calls, which is also super effective. Um, you have a number of community organizations, maybe your organization that are calling families or calling community members that you would tend to work with or see in person just to see how they're doing, maybe do a needs assessment, um, offer any, um, you know, knowledge about resources that they may need help with or to navigate, um, and just incorporating census outreach at the end of the call by asking if they've taken the census yet, and answering any questions they may have and providing just kind of that information that they may not know. Um, did you know that, um, you know, it's really important for community funding. It's really important for um, uh, our political representation for our communities, or just even letting them know that, you know, please respond before July 31st, um, because um, come mid August, um, census takers will be knocking on doors of folks that haven't responded. So it's really simple survey, nine basic questions take no longer than five minutes. Um, if you respond right now, it'll really help the future of our communities and um, you won't get that door knocked. Just offering that kind of information at the end of a check-in call can also be very effective. Um, thinking about outreach to children, um, there have been some organizations like England Pierce, San Jose Public Library, that did um, census story time on YouTube. I'm not really sure how they distribute it, but I'm sure through like social media or a newsletter um, to families uh, that they can just, you know, have the kiddos watch and that can, you know, have some time. They can busy themselves during shelter in place and also learn about the census and incorporate that into the activity. Um, there are census mailing campaigns, so I've linked our postcards and print collateral here, but there are a number of groups that have great print collateral that you can include um, in mailers to clients. Um, maybe even write a message, just letting them, letting them know you're thinking of them um, or something like that. Or if you already have mailers going out um, to community members, just including 
a line about the census. Don't forget to take the census online by phone or by mail before July 31st can go a long way. Um, and just generally incorporating census messaging into existing programs. Um, it doesn't need to be, you know, creating this, um, this big thing around the census. It can just be incorporating it into things that you're already doing and just checking in with folks to see if they responded yet and answering any questions they may have. Um, it's also a good opportunity to maybe provide more information or dispel myths. Um, so if someone's like, oh, you know, I heard about the citizenship question, letting them know that that's not a thing um, and what the census really is. Um, so this could look like incorporating it into newsletters, social media, or maybe food and resource distribution. Um, I'm also curious, are there any ways that maybe your organizations have already incorporated census outreach or you see that it can be incorporated into existing programming? Opening it up. We're actually um, gonna be hosting a couple um, webinars on the census at the end of July to our participants. Awesome. Yeah. Great. And the, and the webinars are kind of just gonna be more informational, do you have? Yeah, they're going, to, they're going to be more informational. We're actually working with the U, um, a couple of the partners at the U.S. Census Bureau to um, give their presentations to our participants in um, awesome. different languages. So we're going to be doing it in Spanish, English, Cantonese, and Mandarin. Great. Great. Thanks for sharing. You can add that to our um, community calendar, Char. So uh, if you want to go to our website and um, you can just click on add event. Um, we're happy to help spread the word for you. I don't think that we planned on making it um, a public event. I think we really wanted to make sure our participants and their families are being counted. But um, oh, I'll, okay. follow, I'll follow back with our um, our group to see if that's what they wanted to do. I just got back from maternity leave on Monday, so I'm kind of just catching up oh, with everything. <laughs> congratulations. That thank is something you. to celebrate. <laughs> thank you. But thank yeah, you. Let us know how we can support you. I think Amina and I are both willing to, to help you out if needed. Awesome. Thank you so much. Of course. Really, thanks for sharing. I know Asian Law Caucus is doing a lot around census. So do you want to share anything, Elliot? Um, one of my duties as an intern with the Asian Law Alliance has just been to like send a lot of emails to people telling them to fill out the census, telling them about all the information uh, that's relevant to the census, like all the funding and um, community funding and all that stuff that will um, be in it receive benefits as a result of the census. Great, great. Yeah, so we just need a lot of outreach work, uh, Asian Law Alliance. Yeah, yeah, that one-on-one -on -one outreach goes a really long way. I know it's kind, of, it's kind of hard when we're not doing it in person, but even just, you know, emails or phone calls and answering people's specific questions, kind of hearing them out and providing that information and just being there as a resource really does go a long way. Um, so thanks for all the work that you all are already doing. Um, I know we have around 10 minutes, and just because it's been kind of a more intimate conversation, I don't think we need to do breakout rooms, but I'll just kind of walk through um, some things that, you know, if you all wanted to take back or practice later or for anyone that's watching this recorded session, um, the idea was to have um, breakout rooms to practice kind of doing either a warm, simulating a warm call to a community member or family that you already knew. Um, as well as a cold call. So someone that's maybe contacting you to use services or get resources for the first time and ways to incorporate census outreach into that conversation. Um, so the first scenario was you're doing a warm call to a family to see how they're doing and complete a needs assessment. The person on the phone has not completed the census. Scenario two is that you are contacted by a family that's looking to use their services for the first time and that person on the phone has also not completed the census. Um, asking you all to kind of play around with, you know, the reasons that you may have not completed the census, some possible ones where that they didn't know much about the census or maybe thought it was over. A lot of folks, you know, seeing a lot of buzz around April 1st is census day, make sure you get counted, thought that um, after April 1st, they missed the opportunity. Um, but it's really important folks know that they can respond. They, there's still time. There's still time to respond. Um, other reasons, other common reasons are security concerns. Is my data protected? What will they ask? Uh, I don't want to give my information out. Um, or another reason, they don't think it's important or will make a difference. What does my individual response matter? 
Um, and then also encourage you all to create your own, kind of play with it. I know when I first started this position, I did kind of a canvassing training when in-person outreach was still a thing. And I was pretending to be a grandma and the canvasser or play canvasser was telling me about the importance of census to helping, you know, support education in our communities. And I went off on a tangent about my grandbaby who had a recital later and they did a really good job about bringing it, hearing me out, of course. Um, and being sweet, but bring it back into the census and things that I was talking about. So um, we're not going to do this now, but just if anyone's listening on this recording or if you all want to bring this back, um, really encourage you to kind of play with it and think about how conversations play out in real life and kind of incorporate that to practice. Um, so when it really happens, it feels natural. Um, this is just kind of a sample. Yes. Sorry, I was curious to know if we can hear maybe from Elliot and Shar, like what are some of the things that you have heard or, or have you heard any resistance from um, people that you work with? Um, you know, just curious to know, like what are the things that seem to hold people back that, um, that you interact with every day? Mm -hmm. I don't think I've, I've heard a lot of resistance around the census. I think it's a lot of um, not enough education around the census. So um, earlier this year, I was like, I well, earlier last year, um, when we started the whole planning sessions for the census in Santa Clara County, um, they, I, I was in New Orleans and I ended up talking to our Uber driver about the census and he, he didn't understand what the census was. Also, he thought it was voting and I'm like, no, it's completely separate from voting. And so it ended up being a whole education thing. So I don't think a lot of people even really understand the census in that way. And so I don't think it's resistance. I think it's, it's an education kind of thing. And um, I think it's just starting to get lost with everything that's really going on, especially um, being that this year is an election year also. And so not only are the census mailers going out, there's like Medicaid, Medi-Cal mailers going out, and then there's also like election mailers going out. So it's starting to get kind of lost in, um, in the information that's actually going out there. So, I, so that's just, that's my, my take on it. Definitely. Thank you for sharing that. And cool that you got to talk to somebody even in a different state about it. <laughs> yeah, it was really, it was really exciting. Um, and then I kind of was like, oh my gosh, I'm like that person. <laughs> that, that, that That's okay. About work. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> but he Elliot. was really excited about it because he was like, oh my God, I have to tell all my friends about it. I'm like, yeah, please do because that affects like, you're in New Orleans. You guys have hurricanes all the time. That affects all of the funding that happens, like, you know, for all of the hurricane help and everything like that. And they're like, he's like, oh my God, you're right. So, yeah. We do That's have awesome. an expert here. We do. Yeah. Um. And it's really all about like the census. I always think the census just impacts so many things. And it's about figuring out through your conversation what matters to that person. Um, there's so many things to connect it to, so it's just about what's relevant to them. That's awesome to hear. Thank you, Cher. Did you want to share something, Elliot? Oh yeah, sure. Um, I don't. I haven't really like faced a whole lot of resistance from people about the census. It's kind of the same situation with Charlene. They don't really understand like the magnitude the importance of what the census is so that's like a job for me to do to tell them more about how really important it is definitely well thank you both for doing that it's, it really goes a long way it's super important work so hats off to you I'm not wearing a hat but <laughs> um so I know we're we're short on time so I'm just going to kind of go this is up there kind of a sample call script of um, you know introducing yourself and asking how the person's doing connecting um don't want to just call just for the census right off the bat um and just kind of depending on the conversation figuring out when could be a good time to just ask if they've completed the census could just be at the end and kind of like you both have talked about just offering yourself up as a resource or hearing based on what they're saying 
what information you might want to provide about the census because you know either resistance or hesitancy or just it, it tends to come from a place of not fully knowing what the census is and what it's about and why it's important. Um, if they have completed the census, you know, thank them for their time and what they're doing for our community. Um, if they have not, um, just kind of reminding them about the timeline um, that census takers start visiting after July 31st. So it's really important to respond as soon as you can. Um, and then just giving them the resources they need for how they can respond. Um, and of course, kind of any additional points about maybe why the census is important to you, why you think it's important to get counted, um, how it's important to our community, um, based on your conversation. I've also, like Shar, had many conversations in, you know, lists about the census. If someone ends up asking me about what I do, and then they're like, what is the census? Isn't that over? Why is it important? And then you kind of find a moment based on your conversation with them about why, what, what how it clicks and why it's important to them and important to our community. Um, I just really quickly want to kind of cover some frequently asked questions about counting children. So how would you all count a child who is living with a relative? Like whose form would that child be counted on? Isn't it by address? So. Um wherever the child lives in that address that's the part that's the address that it gets counted in mm -hmm. so if they if they live and sleep with that relative most of the time they should be counted with that relative on their census form exactly um what about a child who lives and sleeps in multiple places so maybe they have parents or guardians that are separated um, but they share custody how might you count that child so my understanding is it's whoever has the greater custody of that child. But I'm curious to know if it's 50-50, what do you do? Is Any it where, the, well, is that where the child goes to school? Like if it's 50-50 and they're in different school districts, it depends on where the child's school is and then that well, person will get counted or? I would say yes, but I also know of some um, parents that are in the same school district and share custody. <laughs> so that's why mm -hmm. I'm curious to know what the answer is. Yeah, there's actually not really kind of a true official answer. Um, just based on kind of the where they live and sleep most of the time. If it's kind of 50 50, so that's hard to determine. I personally and kind of our team would kind of encourage the parent to think like Shar said, okay, where, where do they go to school? Because you're thinking about resources, right? Um, and then making the decision based on that. And if you still can't <laughs> figure out where the child should be counted based on that, then I would just put it down to where was the child on April 1st? With, with whom were they yeah. on April um, 1st? And then that's where they get counted. Um, Perfect. And then what about a child whose parents parents or guardian guardians forgot to include them on a census form they already submitted. So let's say on March 20, 20th, they submitted a census form um, with them, the, the cousin that lives in the house, and the teenage daughter, but they forgot to include the two-year-old. What would, well, how would you count that two-year-old? Any ideas? Can you resubmit? Yeah, can't you go back online with your code and edit it? So yes, with the, with the minor correction. So you can go, let's say they submitted online, um, but they forgot the two-year-old. They can go back online, but submit without the code. Because basically, the, since it's a unique code for your address, it can only be used once. But if they go back online and they're, um, of course, using the same address, then the Census Bureau, when they're collecting all that data, will be able to see, oh, this is a duplicate, but there's, there's one difference and see that, oh, the child was missing on the original submitted form and use the second form. So you just basically go back and resubmit um, your responses, make sure to include the whole family that was included um, in the original response and include the child. Um, so basically that's submitting another form without the ID that includes everyone in the house. Yeah, great. 
And then um, what about a child who's born after April 1st? Would they not get counted? They do get counted. <laughs> Because I counted, because my daughter was born on April 4th, and um, I waited to fill out my census form till she was born, and so I actually, because um, it's, it's, if it was, because April 1st is like technically census day, so you count everything that was, every person that lives in your house after April 1st, kind of, right? So Especially technically, like, according to the Census Bureau, you you you're you should a baby that was born after April first shouldn't be counted. However, kind of our where our team stands is that our kind of communities or California tend to not overcount. We tend to have an undercount. So we kind of think, especially given everything, that that is okay. <laughs> but really, it's supposed to be. Um, if a, ba if a baby was born on April 1st or before April 1st, then they would be counted. But if they're born April 1st, they're not really supposed to count. But our team thinks that it's okay. <laughs> so Charlene I think it's was, included. Char was feeding her baby on April 1st, technically. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Um, okay, so I don't want to keep you all much longer. Just really quickly offering up the questions. Um, while people have questions, just letting you know, there are a number of resources out there. This is more geared towards um, resources um, for outreach to families and making sure you reach for young children. This is our resource folder with a number of, you know, um, print collateral that you're welcome to use, social media, um, sample posts that you're welcome to use, with graphics, um, phone banking, call scripts, um, a number of things, a number of resources that are open source. Um, also encourage you all to stay connected. If any questions come up or you, you know, would like anything, you can reach us at census2020 at uwba.org. These are our social media handles, um, hashtags, Bay Area Accounts 2020, we hell account. You see on my t-shirt, Jen is also wearing hers. Um, we also have a monthly update call this Monday where we kind of provide a regional update. Um, I will share that in the chat right now. Um, so please register. Um, everyone is welcome. We kind of just go over what's happening in our region in terms of like census responses and updates from the Census Bureau, good things to know, um, as well as kind of updates from us, like how you can get swag, um, like these shirts, tote bags, and just things that are going on in the region. Um, so thank you again so much for joining. And I'll stop. I'm just going to go through some of these slides so you all see. But are there any questions? This is an example of our collateral and Santa Clara's response rate. As you can see, Santa Clara County is doing really well, but there are areas like downtown San Jose, um, San Jose, Palo Alto, and Gilroy Unincorporated that have um, pretty low self-response rates. So these are areas that definitely need some more attention um, in terms of sensitive outreach. Um, but I will stop there, see if there are any questions before we close. Are there any local um, resources that you have for seniors? For in seniors? So um, we at United Way, I'm trying to think, we don't have kind of messaging that tailored towards seniors um, specifically, but there are groups. Um, what is that group called? I will, do you mind um, sending me an email maybe at census2020? Do you um, have your? Yes, I can put it in the chat. Okay. Because um, I can follow up to give you, because there are uh, a number of orgs that are doing, centering their census outreach around reaching seniors and people um, with disabilities. But I can send you those resources. Great. Are there any other questions? Oh, let me make sure I give you the registration for Monday's call. I want to thank you, Amina, and I want to thank Elliot and Char for being such good sports and um, 
congratulations for beating me on the Kahoot quiz. <laughs> if I can ask you to please uh, fill out our evaluation as well, we want to make sure that the programming that we bring to all of you is relevant to the work that you're doing. Um, and I really want to appreciate you for taking the time for being here this morning as well. Um, if you do have more questions, Amina put her email address in the chat. I will also be sending a thank you email to you, um, to everyone that registered actually, and um, we can include the slides. Yes? Yes. The slides, um, which will include all of those resource links that Amina showed you. Um, so I think on that note, just because uh, I want to be respectful of time, um, I want to thank everyone again for being here and uh, let us know if you have any other questions.